In Cambridge, England, stands the Fitzwilliam Museum, which boasts a very fine collection of the paintings of the old Dutch masters. Among these works is an early 17th century painting called View of Scheveningen Sands, which depicts groups of people standing on the seashore on a cold winter's day. That has always been seen as a rather unremarkable painting, but also a mystery. Why on earth would the artist depict something like this? What were those people doing out on the beach on such a cold day? The people on the sand, as well as those up on the cliffs, are looking at something, but there's nothing to look at. What were they doing? Why were they there? What were they looking at? It was a mystery until a few years ago, when a postgraduate student was cleaning and restoring the painting. She discovered an old layer of varnish and some newer paint that had been placed over the original masterpiece. As she began to scrape off that varnish and that overlay of paint, another figure appeared. Even more mysteriously, that figure seemed to be standing above the water, on the horizon. That made no sense either. She scraped further, and then she discovered another figure, a huge figure of a beached whale washed up onto the shore. This man on the horizon was actually standing on the back of the whale, taking its measurements. That is what all those people had gone out to see. Now that the junk was removed from the painting, the whole composition made sense. No one knows who painted the whale out of the picture or why. Maybe the picture was easier to sell without a dead animal in the middle of it, but it was obviously done many years later and not by the hands of the original artist. Now the painting is restored to the way the artist intended. The mystery is revealed and the whole picture makes perfect sense. Discovery is a wonderful thing. There is so much there under the surface waiting to be discovered. It's not until we can see it that the whole picture makes sense. About 500 years ago, the people of Europe were engaged in the great age of discovery all of a sudden, they wanted to go out and discover new oceans, new lands, new islands, new passageways, new routes. And they did. They set off sometimes for political purposes, sometimes for commercial purposes, and sometimes for scientific purposes. They wanted to see what was out there. One of the most famous of these discoverers is a person whom we celebrate this week, Christopher Columbus. It was on October 12, 1492, that Columbus stumbled upon an island. Now, he had no idea he was in the middle of the Caribbean. He thought he was someplace entirely different, but that doesn't matter. He had stumbled on something new. They began to call it the New World, it was not a new world at all, of course, just as the Pacific Ocean was not a new ocean, certainly not to the fish living in it. This part of the world was not new at all to the people who had been ha inhabiting it for thousands of years. But it was new to Columbus's people, new to the people on the other side of the world. So they christened it the New World. That was the beginning of a whole new era an era of back-and-forth trade. Things were moving from here across the ocean to Europe and vice versa. Would you believe that before the discovery of the so-called New World, the people of Europe had never seen a potato, had never eaten a tomato, had never imagined an ear of corn? 
What were those people eating all those years over there? All of that was carried from this part of the world to that part. But it was a two-way street. The Europeans brought over things, too, like horses and diseases. There once was another discoverer of a completely different type, a Hungarian scientist by the name of Albert St. Giorgi, who discovered not a new land, not a new ocean, not a new star, but a new vitamin, vitamin C. He used to say, Discovery consists in seeing what everyone else has been seeing, and thinking what no one else has thought. There is so much waiting to be discovered. Some might discover new lands, some new oceans, some new planets or constellations, some new medicines or vitamins, or perhaps one might discover a beached whale under the varnish. But there is also a vaster ocean right inside ourselves waiting to be discovered. How little we know ourselves and how little effort most of us make to discover our deeper self, to probe into our soul. How often, for instance, do we see ourselves as outsiders, people who somehow do not fit in, are not invited to the banquet reserved for the chosen? What a refreshing discovery to find that we too, like those other outsiders in the story, are the very ones chosen, the very ones invited, the very ones called. How beautiful to find that we are not outsiders at all, but very much on the inside. The 20th century mystic monk Thomas Merton wrote, What can we gain by sailing to the moon if we are not able to cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? This is the most important of all voyages of discovery, and without it all the rest are not only useless, but disastrous. Before we go searching for new worlds, let us open our eyes to the beautiful new world right inside ourselves, a world we have perhaps never seen, never even dreamed, existed. There are uncharted islands there, places in the heart where no one has ever gone, least of all ourselves. There are oceans to cross and universes to explore right here inside our soul. All of humanity, all of human beauty is right there because the beauty of God is right there, too, waiting to be discovered. But as Proust wrote, The voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Let us open those eyes, strip off the varnish that clouds the picture, and discover the original composition underneath. Then, at last, freed from the accumulation of layers not meant to be there, the puzzling parts will begin finally to make sense. The beauty of the whole will take shape before our eyes when we finally see ourselves as God has painted us. Thank you.